So just, I checked this earlier, but the lighting is a little different, so my friend Santiago's in the back, is this good? Okay, cool. Also, you should, you should try compiling this on the latest nightly, it's pretty funny. <laughs> All right, so my name is Sean Griffin, I'm a 10X hacker ninja guru at Shopify. If you're wondering, uh, <laughs> if you're wondering what that means, it means that when I was applying for my work permit in Canada, I thought it would be funny to see what would happen if I put that as my job title. Turns out, what happens is, I can no longer legally work in Canada as any job title other than 10X Hacker Ninja Guru. <laughs> and I'm no longer allowed to fill out government paperwork unsupervised. Uh, these are the things I'm known for making. I also made this thing recently. Uh, my friend Steve, who uh, I've seen give a lot of talks at Ruby conferences, around this point he always goes up and he's, uh, he says something along the lines of, you know, I mostly write Rust these days, but I still really love Ruby, and you know how much I love it because I have it one tattooed on my body. Well, I'm sorry to one-up you, Steve, but uh, I literally named my firstborn child Ruby, so. <laughs> She's also a big fan of Rust. All right, on to the actual talk. <laughs> So the, ultimately, the heart of software engineering is managing trade-offs. And there are a lot of trade-offs in your choice of language. For example, if you were to try and map out languages on a spectrum from high level to low level, you might have something like Haskell on one side and something like C on the other. And if you were to just map out a arbitrary pro of Haskell, well, most people would say it's got a really, really good type system. And one of the cons of it is that you're gonna lose control over the layout of your data. So on the other side, we have C. And C gives you very, very tight control over how your data is laid out in memory, and you give up a lot of things in exchange for that. <laughs> Enter Rust. Rust really loves to blow up these sort of traditional trade-offs. Concurrency without data races, memory safety without garbage collection, and so on. This is a big part of Rust's secret sauce. It's what makes Rust special. You could even call it Rust's fire flower. <laughs> the combination of having control over memory layout combined with a proper type system can enable some really cool things. Let's take a look at an example. A hash set is an unordered collection uh, of unique elements. It works very much like a hash map it, where you only look at the keys and not the values and Rust implements it exactly like this. It wraps, uh, implements hash set as a very thin wrapper around hash map. A hash set has a single field, which is a hash map where the key is whatever we are putting into the set, and the value is an empty tuple, also known as unit. The value itself doesn't actually matter for the implementation of this hash set to be correct. We could use any type. For example, in Ruby, a set is implemented in exactly the same way, but they use a Boolean rather than uh, an empty tuple. While both implementations are correct, there's a big performance difference. Specifically, Rust is able to take advantage of the fact that the value is zero-sized, and it eliminates a bunch of code because of that, and that creates a huge difference in performance. How big? Well, I did a very, very unscientific benchmark, and I found that switching a uh, hash set to use Boolean instead of unit gave me a 20% loss of performance. That's free performance, and you can take advantage of those same kind of gains just by understanding some of the guarantees that Rust can provide. So I've been talking a lot about this type being at zero size. I wanna talk about how you know the size of a type. You could start out with the simplest case, primitives. A lot of the primitives in Rust actually happen to have the size in the name, U32, U16, et cetera. Uh, we have car here. Car is a, uh, is a single Unicode character, and it is four bytes. If you have a struct with a single field, that struct is going to be the, uh, the same as the size of its field, just like in C. If you have more than one field, the struct is gonna be the size of each of its fields added together. So in this case, foo is going to be the size of two cars. Enums act very much the same like structs, at least if they only have a single variant. Uh, you could pretend that bar was a struct, and whatever the size of bar is, is going to be the size of foo. It only has one field, that is car, so the size of foo is car. When you add on a second variant, you're gonna add, first of all, one byte so that Rust knows whether you have a bar or a baz. And then the size of foo is going to be that one byte plus the size of its largest variant. 
and you could determine the size of each variant by pretending it were a struct. So Baz here, if we wrote it as a struct, would look like this. It has no fields, and its size is zero. So when we come back to this, we already uh, looked at what bar would be earlier. We know that, one, uh, that four is in fact larger than zero, so the size of foo is gonna be five. If we changed Baz to be a different type, one that was larger than car, now this, uh, the size of foo is gonna be the size of that larger type plus one. So let's look at a little bit more complex type. Let's say that you uh, wanted to implement a new string type and you wanted to implement that as a singly linked list because there's absolutely no way that could ever cause pains for anybody. <laughs> so you might, uh, if, you're, if you're new to Rust, you might try writing it like this. Let's talk about finding the size of list string. So we need to first figure out which of its variants is the largest. Well, nil has no fields and so it's gonna have a size of zero and I'm gonna guess that's not the largest one here, so we're gonna skip over that. So we look at this uh, variant called cons. So we need to add up the size of each of its fields. Head is a car, and tail is a list string. So car is four bytes, and the size of a list string, well, so to determine the size of a list string, first you need to figure out which of its variants is the largest, and oh no. I actually really love this error because you basically only ever run into it when you're trying to implement a singly linked list, and so the, uh, <laughs> And the error message, if you do Rusty explain, is literally just you're trying to do a singly linked list. Here's exactly the code you need to write. It's, it's great. <laughs> anyway, so it's complaining because uh, a struct, ha this enum has itself as a member, which means that its size would be theoretically infinite. So we need to introduce some indirection there. So we're gonna change uh, this to uh, box up the list string. So box is the heap allocated pointer, if there are those that aren't familiar with it and the size of a pointer, at least on my machine, is going to be eight bytes. So now the size of this whole thing is the one byte for the discriminant, eight bytes for the pointer, four bytes for the car, for a total of 13 bytes. For those of you shaking your head about why I'm wrong, I am purposely ignoring padding and alignment and null pointer <laughs> optimizations because they're not super relevant to the, to the point of, uh, of this talk. Uh, now, one of the kind of curses of Rust is it makes it because it makes it so easy to write really, really performant code and it nudges you towards doing things that have very little overhead, it makes you super aware when you're doing something that isn't the most possible performant thing. So, you, so a lot of people look at this and scream, no, no, my singly linked list can't possibly afford the cost of a pointer. But let's look at how we, could, uh, how we could do this differently and avoid actually having to, uh, to do heap allocation. So rather than having list string be an enum, we could instead move any of the behavior that we needed to group together here onto a trait and have two structs instead. So I've omitted the trait here, but we have, we've turned each of our variants into a completely separate struct. And specifically, the case of uh, cons, where we have at least one element, is now generic over the rest of the list. Now, I haven't talked yet about, uh, about how to uh, calculate the size of a generic struct. So let's say we had a struct called pizza. Pizza's generic over its topping. So uh, if we were to, say, have a topping, let's call it pineapple, uh, and we asked the compiler what the size of a pineapple pizza was, it would error because pineapple doesn't belong on a pizza, Steve. <laughs> No, so of, of course pineapple has a size of zero. Uh, if we pretend that, that topping were pineapple, then this would be a single field that is of the type pineapple that, would, uh, have, that has a size of zero, so the struct has a size of zero. And if you had a pizza uh, with a giant hole in it, get it, because its topping is a bite, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, then its size would be one bite. <laughs> so the size of our construct here is going to be the size of a car plus the size of the rest of the list. So what's interesting here is that uh, the size of the entire list is going to be exactly the smallest size possible. The size of an empty list is going to be zero. The size of a list containing one character is going to be the size of exactly one character. And if it had two characters, it'll be the size of two characters, three characters, so on. Uh, there's some other interesting properties for example, uh, you're, you're now actually encoding the length of your string in the type system. 
so things like length will, uh, can potentially get uh, inlined by the compiler and replaced with just a literal. You could, also, uh, you could also do generic code and implement traits, for example, only for empty strings and have that verified at compile time. But this isn't without trade-offs. You can no longer write code like this. If you want to take a list string as an argument, you can't just take a type called list string. You have to, take, you have to write a generic function. You're taking some type t where t implements list string. And if nothing else, this just looks more complicated to me. I if you, if, and when I think about it, it's like, no, but it's really not doing that much different, but you just look at it. You also can no longer pattern match. So if you wanted to write a function that determined if your, if your list string contained the letter A, uh, you might write it like this. And if you, were, if you were to do it generically, you can no longer assume that you either have specifically cons or nil. Since list string is now a trait, theoretically any struct could actually implement it. So you could kind of like maybe write a function that returns the head and an option of the head and tail and do something kind of similar, but just in general, your code's just gonna feel a little bit more complex. You're gonna be, you're, the, the cost that you're gonna be paying for this is gonna be complexity in your code base. Now for a little interim from Ruby. If you need high, if you need high quality Rust code or training, Ruby thinks you should go with integer 32 LLC. <laughs> So let's look at uh, some more code here. Let's look at what happens when we, have, when, we, uh, when we deal with traits. So we have a trait called robot. Robots have a username. We have a lot of great robots in Rust. They, they, they manage the Rust repo for us. They're great. And we're going to say hi to them because we love our robots. We need their username to say hi to them. One of our robots is named Morse. Morse is responsible for merging all of the code into the Rust repo and running CI and doing other great things. Another robot is named Alex. Alex is responsible for, uh, <laughs> Alex is responsible for implementing things. It's a sentient AI. <laughs> so when, uh, the, when the compiler is going through this code, it's gonna go in. Traits aren't really a thing that exists in your final binary. Your operating system doesn't know what a trait is or how to call a method on a trait. So the compiler is gonna go in. It's gonna replace these functions with just an actual plain function. So it, the names are just sort of made up, but uh, in this case we could pretend it was called robot username Boris. It's gonna go take this one and turn that into robot username Alex. Now our say hi function, uh, what Russ is gonna do when we've written it this way is it's going to do a uh, transformation to it called a monomorphization, which is a big, scary, and kind of poorly named term. But this function right now is polymorphic. It can take multiple types. And what monomorphization means is that the compiler is gonna take this function and it's gonna copy it for every type that you're calling it with. So we're gonna get a function called say hi Boris and say hi Alex. And rather than uh, trying to, uh, calling a method from this trait, it's instead going to be calling these specific named functions that we know, that we know exist. Now this is, uh, to a certain extent, a gateway optimization. This is, uh, the, the benefit of this optimization in a vacuum is just that you, get, you have one less dynamic function call. It's not a huge win on its own but this enables other optimizations to occur. Because now the compiler can go uh, look at this function and say, okay, well, robot username Boris, that's a really simple function. I can just inline that. And then it can do the same thing over here. This is uh, about as far as the compiler's gonna be able to go. It can't quite take that last step to look at this and say, well, I could just combine both of these into a single string literal. Um, it'd be cool if it did, but you know what, that's fine. As with all things in programming, there's a trade-off here. Uh, the cost that we're paying for the compiler to generate more efficient code is that it's increasing the size of our binary. It's copying these functions over and over again. And it's going to likely increase your compilation times as well. In some cases, you can opt out of this if you'd rather not pay that cost. By taking a reference to robot, we're taking what's called a trait object. This is sometimes also referred to as type erasure. When we take a trait object, the compiler no longer knows anything about the specific type that we've passed to it. The type has been erased. So what that means is that the compiler can't do monomorphization. It can't generate a, a unique uh, version of this for the type you're passing to it because it doesn't know what type that is. But it also means that the function is not going to get optimized beyond this point. This is as far as the compiler is going to go. It can no longer see past username. 
Baby Ruby says, if you also have trouble figuring out which way to hold a bottle, integer 32 LLC. <laughs> Just all of my cute baby pictures I noticed were in Rust onesies, it's great. All right, so this is type system tricks for the real world, and I've only talked about some world where people use singly linked lists for string, and that's just crazy talk. So let's talk about a real world example. If you go into uh, Diesel's code base and you look at our test suite, you're gonna find this test, where we uh, build our increasingly more complex queries, and we assert that the size of that query is zero. Now I've talked a, a, a good bit about zero size types here. You may be wondering at this point, why on earth do we care whether the size of this is zero? Well, zero size types are particularly interesting. Let me go over a list of all of the, all of the things that you can do with them. And that's it. <laughs> there, it occupies no data. There is nothing you can do with them at runtime. So if a type is zero size, it means that you've structured your code in such a way that everything you're doing with it is, is something that is uh, completely done at compile time. The type itself is guaranteed to be erased because there is nothing you can do with it. So to make this a little bit more clear, I'd like to go through uh, what the compiler is going to do in, when Diesel tries to construct the SQL for this, uh, for this query. Users.find1, this would generate select star from users where users.id equals one. The type that this, uh, that this expression is going to return looks like this. In the interest of keeping things a size that fits on a slide, we're gonna omit a lot of this code and pretend their type only looks like this instead, which is still a slightly large type, but is smaller. Most of the things that I just took off are um, types that are zero sized and basically are saying this part of the query isn't there and are guaranteed to get eliminated. If you wanted to construct it, you would do it like this. This isn't super, uh, the specifics of this isn't super relevant, but the point being that these are all actual concrete types. There is nothing behind a box. There is no, uh, there are no trade objects involved. So this is the function that the compiler is gonna start with. This is the code, I copy pasted it directly from Diesel, and then took off a few generic parameters to make it fit on a slide. <laughs> this first line here says, add this SQL string to the query being constructed. The definition of push SQL is gonna get inline, but we're gonna leave it alone for now and come back to it later. Uh, this section here, we know that the type of self.distinct is no distinct clause, so we could just replace it like that. This function's gonna get inline, the body of that function is literally do nothing, and so that line gets deleted. We know that self.select is of the type default select clause, and uh, the body of default select clause is grab the default selection. The default selection is a tuple of all of the columns. And this is going to get in line to the definition of walk AST for a two element tuple, which is gonna look a little bit funky because this code is generated by a macro, but it's okay because the compiler is gonna come and clean up my mess for me. Now, uh, you know, in a massive breakthrough of computer science, Rust is able to figure out that zero is in fact not equal to zero. <laughs> it's also able to figure out that code that behind if false will never get run, so that just goes away. Same thing, massive breakthrough one is in fact not equal to zero. And if true is always gonna get run, so we just replace that with push a comma. Going up to here, uh, users ID, first we, first we put user, uh, push users, then we push a dot, and then we push ID. Uh, push identifier is going to put a double quote, and that's going to put the, the identifier that we wanted to put out there with uh, replacing all double quotes with double double quotes. Compiler's also gonna be able to see that uh, there are no double quotes in this string, so we just eliminate that entirely. Same thing happens for ID. User's name, oh, hold on, let's scroll, let me scroll up here. Got it. running out of, running out of space. Same thing, from clause, that's just the user's table, we know how to do that. Where clause, so we know specifically that we do have a where clause, so this gets inlined, and we're just gonna push where out there, and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna push the actual value of the where clause. The where clause is uh, ID equals one, so first we're gonna put on user's ID. And then we're gonna put out one. Now one is interesting because this is the only part of this query that is in any way dynamic. So this is just gonna be the code that is pushed this dynamic value. This will actually end up getting in line much, much farther to ver very specifically like create a new vector and stick, and stick these exact bytes on there, but that's very not interesting. Uh, so we're gonna leave it at this stage. So this is the code that we started with, and this is what it got optimized down to. 
Now, you'll notice uh, two things about this. Number one, this is very much larger than what was there before. We also notice if you squint at it, it's really flat. There are no conditionals here. There's no dynamic dispatch going on. This is the sort of code that your CPU is gonna go through very, very quickly. Now this function itself is also going to get inlined. Uh, wait, so what, when we go to this line, push SQL, so this is, this is the, uh, what happens when that function gets inlined. AST pass, the thing that we've been operating on here, is an enum. Diesel do, uh, will actually call this function four times, once with each variant of the enum to do all of the different things that we want to do to the, uh, with that value. Uh, the one that we're caring about right now is actually constructing the SQL string, so that's called the to SQL pass. Uh, but because this function will get inlined itself, and the line immediately before we called the function will be the thing that constructs the AST pass, the compiler is actually just going to know, oh, this is, this is, we always have that variant, so we, can, we uh, don't need to have that conditional. We know that we're always going to run this code. And then the body of push SQL is, is just push, push stir, which is a method on string from the standard library. And so it's gonna do the same thing to all of these other lines. I'm not gonna make you watch every single one of those get transformed. Um, and again, this is, this is as far as the compiler is gonna be able to take it. It is not able to then take that last step that would look really cool on a slide if it did and turn that into a string literal, but it's about as close as it can get. This is effectively let mute s equals, str equals string dot new and then pushing each of these little fragments onto it. The, uh, the bind parameter where the one goes at the very bottom, that's just gonna get uh, in line to push the SQL for a placeholder for a value that gets sent separately. And this is mildly interesting and a decent win for constructing the SQL query. What's really interesting is, uh, is what happens for our other three AST passes. Rails, when it constructs a SQL query, has to go through, goes through a very similar structure and wants all the same information that Diesel has. But when I'm doing this in Rails, I have to uh, try very hard to shoehorn all of this into a single call. We cannot do multiple passes over the AST because it's very expensive. But in Rust, this is the pass where we actually collect the dynamic uh, data. So we still care about this push, uh, that last call, the push bind param, which is that got inlined push bound value. This is the thing where we'll actually serialize the one to the bytes that the database cares about. Um, if we had more than one value, there might be some additional optimizations of specifically the order that we're pushing things, but it's not terribly uh, interesting. What's important though is all of that code that would have been conditionally, if we're in this pass, do this, or all of the code that was there for traversing the AST for everything that didn't have a dynamic piece got eliminated. Another pass that we do is uh, determining whether or not a query is safe to store in our prepared statement cache. And if you don't know what that means, it's okay. What's important to know is that yes, this one is, and we just know that. When people talk about building zero cost abstractions, these optimizations are what make that possible. This is what makes iterator fast. This is what makes futures fast. This is what makes hash set fast. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that using unit instead of bool was about 10 to 20% faster, but I glossed over why that was the case. The reason is because the compiler knows that this value with zero bytes can never be read. It can never be used. So all of the generic code that's responsible for storing the values of a hash map gets eliminated. Now, the compiler could have, in theory, done that same optimization by looking, oh, well, we're just never using the values. Let's eliminate the values. In, this, in practice, it just happens not to. But the, my, the point of that is, uh, the, the fact that this type is zero size, it doesn't enable the optimization, but it does guarantee it. And what we end up with uh, at, at the end of the day when we get to our machine code is the same code that we would have if we wrote a super optimized hash set ourselves. I'd like to thank Shopify, my employer. They paid for me to be here. Please ask me questions now. Thank you very much.